work with um, Professor Vasim Dmitrov from um, University of Calgary and then um, my colleagues from Cybernetica and um, Software Technology Applications Computer Center, DC Gedek, Thomas Scripps, and Jaak Ronmets. So I understand that um, it is a nice habit to start the presentation with a cartoon. So um, I'm starting mine with this cartoon. So the general um, problem setting that we are working in is the one of secure computation outsourcing. So, so let's say you have a small, let's say, embedded device with some sensors, let's say one of these popular activity trackers that uh, measures how you move, measures your blood pressure, your pulse, what, whatever there may be of, of interest to you. And during the day, it will collect a certain amount of data about you. Um, but the problem is that the device itself doesn't have even, let's say, computing power or time or, or complexity to run uh, analysis on top of it. So, so maybe you want to have some aggregate information about your um, progress, um, about how much do you move, about um, how your pulse changes. You may, may want to run all sorts of different statistical analysis on, on top of uh, your data that the device is gathering. The problem is that the device itself, for some reason, is not able to do this data processing. So there is a friendly cloud service provider who tells, listen, come here, I have all the computing power you will ever need. Please just give me your data. And that's what you do. You, you send your data to this uh, computing service provider. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that the data may be private, like, like it is in the case of your health data. And we get in trouble when this cute little cloud provider turns out to be malicious and wants to get hold of your private data. So the problem or the solution to this problem would be a secure way of outsourcing this computation, doing something with your data before you give it to the cloud computing provider so that the cloud provider would be able to perform computations but it would not be able to read your private data or understand it. So there are um, several uh, solutions, or principal solutions uh, proposed for such a problem. Um, I think historically one of the first ones is garbled circuits, um, two-party uh, computation outsourcing solution, if you want to look at it that way. Then there are multi-party computations uh, let's say, based on secret sharing, so the device would share the data into different parts, um, each one of, of which, uh, taken individually, does not reveal anything about the information, but when combined together, again, it will reveal the uh, outcome, and of course, the interesting part is that it's actually possible to compute with such data. And then third, and last but not least, of course, the holy grail of secure computation outsourcing, a fully amorphic encryption that has um, seen quite an improvement in recent years. Um, maybe quite soon it will be uh, efficient enough to run these kinds of computations. But in um, this work I'm going to talk to you about um, the real implementation we have still done on multi-party computations on uh, secret shared data. The problem with um, these um, computation uh, paradigms or, or solutions is that typically they compute on either directly on bits or on um, integers of some sort, typically modular integers, modulo p, for instance. If, if we want to do Shamin secret sharing, we are bound to do it in some, some uh, field, for instance. But um, if you want to build higher level statistical data analysis applications, um, you would actually need a more flexible um, domain for your um, for your values. So if you want to compute elementary statistics, you immediately uh, need division, you immediately uh, need square roots, and, and there you go. Um, so you would need some sort of uh, more flexible data structure. Um, the problem, well, of course, the, the standard um, uh, way of representing uh, um, real numbers is the IEEE 754 floating point standard. Unfortunately, that one is not very well uh, uh, suited for uh, secure computations on protected oblivious values. Uh, there are various reasons for that. 
first, it uh, explicitly assumes bit level access to, uh, to this um, uh, data representation. So if you have 64 bit um, uh, value for your floating point number, then one bit of it is a sign, um, a couple of bits of it is an exponent, and the rest is, um, is your mantissa. Um, which uh, are packed together into one representation, and unpacking it is very costly in the oblivious setting. Uh, also, uh, this standard has uh, non-number values to represent um, the results of, let's say, division by zero, or square root of minus one, and this sort of exceptions would also need oblivious handling, um, which adds complexity. So typically what we do in, in this sort of oblivious uh, real number implementations is we actually ignore these values and, and say that it is a responsibility of the algorithm designer to make sure that uh, this sort of exceptions do not happen. It is sometimes possible. Um, actually, it's very often possible. So um, in order to make um, secure computations and real numbers efficient, it is reasonable to deviate from this standard. And that's what we do. <laughs> um, uh, typically also, what you get in these sorts of implementations is that you can sacrifice some uh, precision and get better performance out of your solution. So in the end of the day, that we are interested in is the performance precision ratio. And, and this is also that I'm, I'm going to show later in, in, in the uh, benchmarking session. <clears throat> okay, so uh, some reference to previous work. One of the first um, uh, lines of work has been done by Octavian and Katrina and, and um, his colleagues uh, around 2010 uh, when, when they started um, work on um, secure fixed point arithmetic that has its limitations. So soon after uh, real floating point solutions started to emerge, I think one of the first ones uh, we've been able to dig, dig up is, uh, is proposed by Franz and Katzenbeis in 2011. Uh, they had some um, uh, elementary operations targeted towards uh, signal processing. Uh, they were working in two-party uh, two garbled circuit um, framework, and they didn't have uh, reference to implementation detail. The first implementations came in a couple of years, a year or two later. I think uh, the implementation of our working group uh, was, was there in 2012. It was uh, published in 2015. So um, uh, another group, Elias Gari and others, got to publish quite a similar piece of work um, uh, in 2013. And from that, um, it has developed in several uh, directions. More uh, elementary functions were added, performance improvements were implemented, and so on. So our work also builds on top of these contributions. In this paper, we um, contribute two new uh, implementation paradigms for secure real arithmetic, There's something called golden section numbers and something we call logarithmic floats. Um, we um, describe the um, construction of elementary operations on top of uh, these paradigms and present benchmarking solutions based on uh, ShareMind secure multiparty computation engine to get these uh, performance precision estimates. So first, to introduce the golden section numbers, they um, are represented in form A minus phi B, where phi is the uh, golden section um, constant, which means that phi squared is equal to phi plus one, which is important when we start to simplify, let's say, products. Internal representation of these numbers is just two integers. Um, what, what are the good sides of this representation? The, of course, addition and subtractions are, are basically local operations. If you're, if you're talking about the multiparty computations, you just add the uh, components of, of the representation. And you get uh, your representation for the sum, and similarly for um, uh, subtraction. Multiplication is a little bit more complex if you take two numbers in this form. You do the elementary math, you use a representation of phi square, you get this sort of representation, which means to multiply two golden section numbers, um, in fact, you need to perform uh, five multiplications in your basic data domain, 
which is, in our case, the modular integers, modular some two to the power of n. Uh, also, a good thing is we do not need a special uh, handling of negative numbers, because this representation gives you negative numbers as well. There are also um, cons to this representation. Um, one of the, uh, the most burning ones being, of course, that multiplication overflows quite fast. So in this sense, uh, this representation is similar to fixed point representation, where you also have lots of trouble with, uh, with uh, multiplication overflow. Uh, so for instance, if you square your golden section number, your bit representation of the square is roughly twice as long as the representation for the uh, original number, which uh, means that you, you get very fast overflow in these representants, as I call them. Um, luckily, um, it is the case that um, these golden section numbers are, uh, um, are not unique representation. So what you can do, typically, is whenever you have a large number, a number with large representants, um, where the number itself is not necessarily large, but the representants are, are large due to multiplication, you are typically able to find a relatively close number, where the exact meaning of close is detailed in the paper, where, where I suggest you would look for the details. But you very often can replace the number with large representants with a close one having much smaller representants. You lose some precision, but I mean, that's, that's the uh, trade-off you make, right? Um, so the whole problem of normalization is then um, replaced by a problem of finding close enough representations, which on the other hand is equivalent of finding good approximations of zero. So basically you want to have your database of approximations of zero that you can then select a suitable uh, number to add to your big representants and then get more or less equivalent close number with sufficiently small representants. The, the problem is, of course, how do you build this database of approximations of zero? And even more importantly, how do you query it efficiently? So uh, remember, these A's and B's are all in the protected domain. So, so they are either encrypted, either secret shared, you cannot access them directly. So you have to somehow understand what is a good approximation of zero that you could subtract from your big representants and to get a normalized uh, version of your number. So this is one of the technical contributions of the paper, is how to exactly uh, build this database. This is uh, something we will call normalization sets, which basically is a base for your database. And to um, cure this, unfortunately, you need still the bit extraction of your value, which is a costly operation in, in our domain. Uh, we also have, by now, implemented an alternative solution, but that is already a um, post-paper uh, contribution. The other uh, computation paradigm that we have defined are so-called logarithmic floats, and these are now, in their construction, a closer to standard uh, IEEE representation. Remember, IEEE representation was your mantissa, your exponent, and your sine. So here, we also have your sine. So this S is just 0 or 1. So this is the sine bit. This Z here is also, it's, it's also quite standard trick in these cases. It's a 0 indicator. So it's also 0 or 1. So if it turns out to be 0, then the whole number is 0. If it's 1, then we just look at the, the rest of the number. It makes some of the operations a bit easier. And then the crucial part is this E here, which is the exponent. And also similar to IEEE standard, we consider the exponent being biased and also shifted. So in, in, in fact, what you get here is, is a certain fixed point number with n bits after your, uh, your uh, binary point. So this is the important representation uh, no, part is this E, which we um, interpret as a certain fixed point number. And the rest of, uh, of the representation is your zero indicator and your sign indicator. So basically, we, uh, from the IEEE uh, 754, 
a representation, we throw out the mantissa and we turn the exponent from an integer to a fixed point number. Uh, so what are the pros of, of this um, representation? Of course, multiplication and other multiplicative uh, operations like inverses, roots, powers um, are very easy to compute. Uh, cons, of course, that addition becomes very non-trivial. So if, if in case of Gilded section numbers, addition was very easy and multiplication was hard, so here is vice versa, your multiplication is trivial, you basically just add the uh, exponents and take care of the bias. Um, but addition is, is, is non-trivial, and basically what you need to do is you need to interpolate a logarithm one, of, of 1 plus 2 to the power of x. And um, I, I'm not going into technical details here. I, I refer you to the paper. Essentially what's happening is we um, use piecewise approximation with uh, certain hand-picked uh, Chebyshev polynomials which are uh, easy to compute in certain interval. Um, okay, so the security claims, what, are, uh, what we uh, obtain, uh, of course, the security claims uh, depend on which uh, basic uh, domain you will choose. If you, if you choose uh, fully homomorphic encryption, then you get one sort of security claims. We have been using uh, ShareMind um, Secure Multiparty Computation Engine in its default three-party additive secret sharing configuration, which uh, um, is a semi-honest uh, setting, but you still get privacy against one active adversary. Um, later today, there will be another paper, I think it's the first paper of the third MPC session, that will claim this uh, result as a new result. Um, I claim that we had it last year. In, um, in the paper that was uh, published on um, CSF um, 2015, so essentially, uh, we we'll also prove that what ShareMind like uh, setups achieve is actually more than just semi honest uh, behavior. We also get uh, active security uh, with respect to privacy. So active adversaries cannot uh, violate privacy. We actually have, uh, have much more. Um, we have uh, implemented all these protocols in uh, ShareMind uh, domain specific language that we have developed for. Uh, exactly developing uh, basic computation protocols. So there is a specific protocol, DSL, which uh, comes with a compiler that actually has these security proofs implemented. Um, this means that if you write your uh, code in the DSL, you compile it, and if it compiles, this uh, automatically means that your privacy claims are verified. So that, that, that comes with an integrated uh, um, prover for, for this uh, security property, which, uh, which I think is actually very useful. So, so you, you get lots of uh, trouble off your shoulders. You, you don't need to worry about whether I uh, composed these uh, uh, elementor operations in a secure way and so on. You get these sorts of proofs actually for free these days. And, and the details for this, I refer you to uh, this paper by load and, and run mats. Okay, so let's go to the benchmarks. Uh, uh, as I said, we are interested in um, performance uh, versus uh, precision. So um, uh, this is the error <laughs> um, axis. Uh, it, it decreases to the right, so everything to the right is good. And this is the performance uh, measured in operations per second, um, it's not perhaps a very good uh, measure every time, but we'll come back to that. So the, the corner you want to be in is this right upper corner, which means that you have very good performance and very small error. Uh, the legend that you see here is the boxes of the logarithmic floats, um, LD, LS, and LH roughly corresponds to double precision, single precision, and half precision. Um, this is sort of design precision that is supposed to more or less match, good, that is supposed to more or less match um, uh, double and single precision of IEEE floats. Uh, the uh, circles are uh, IEEE floats more or less in our own implementation, which, which means the representation in sign, mantissa, and exponent uh, uh, framework. The triangles are the golden numbers, 
uh, where let's say Wilton 64 means that the representation consists of two 64-bit uh, integers, and then the fix is what you would expect a, a fixed point number implementation. So uh, for, for idea, oh, and, and also uh, we've, we've put um, um, to uh, the same graph two um, inherently different things. Um, fixed point like numbers give you good absolute precisions. Floating point numbers give you good relative precision. But uh, to save space, we have actually put both of them on the same graph. So uh, the numbers measured in absolute scale are labeled with A, and the numbers labeled with star mean that uh, this implementation achieves uh, perfect precision in, in terms of your underlying data structure. So you do not lose precision, for instance, when you multiply, you throw away some of the lower bits. Um, so for instance, in case of addition, adding fixed point numbers and golden section numbers happens without loss of, of any precision. So that's what this star is about. Um, for addition, the picture is more or less what you would expect. Uh, your golden section numbers and fixed point numbers perform marvelously in, in case of um, addition. And your uh, floating point numbers and logarithmic numbers lag quite behind. So this was what was expected. For multiplication, I guess the picture is also as one would expect. The, um, Logarithmic numbers are basically the best ones because multiplying them, as we saw, was pretty straightforward. Uh, then the floating point numbers are a bit behind. Um, and fixed point and um, uh, golden numbers are doing not so great. And this is actually the place where this performance operations per second is probably not the best measure because um, there are several aspects to, uh, to secret shared implementations. You get several sorts of complexity. You first get round complexity, uh, which means how many computation rounds you have to go through. And you also get communication complexity, meaning how much data you actually need to, to push through. Um, what I can say is that golden section numbers actually use less rounds uh, than the fixed point numbers. But the problem is that our tests have been run in a very low latency network which means that uh, that uh, large round number is, is not really penalized as much as it would be in, in case of real computations. Yes, thank you. And um, uh, in case of inverse, uh, the um, logarithmic numbers are doing fantastically, uh, the reason being that inverse in case of logarithmic numbers is just inverting the exponent, and that's it. So it's a local, local operation you don't even lose any precision in that operation. And of course, as expected, floating point numbers do also reasonably well. And fixed point like numbers are doing not so great. So uh, most of our uh, benchmarks actually were kind of multiplicative benchmarks, which means that uh, mostly you will see in these benchmarks logarithmic numbers and floating point numbers doing better. Again, this is sort of unfair. But many of the elementary uh, functions actually happen to be multiplicative, like inverses, square roots, and their powers. So this is also what you would expect from them. Um, exponents and um, uh, logarithms we also implemented, uh, but only for, for the case of uh, floating point numbers and, uh, golden uh, and uh, logarithmic numbers. It didn't even make sense to try that out in, in case of uh, fixed point uh, like numbers. Computing exponent flows so, uh, overflows so fast that it doesn't really give you anything. Um, and the last benchmark is a natural logarithm. And we see that uh, here the uh, logarithmic um, uh, floating point numbers actually outperform the uh, real floating point numbers. So the conclusions, as expected, there is no single winner. Uh, golden section numbers perform better if uh, we need many additions, and logarithmic floats behave better if you need many multiplications. Um, what you will typically use is both, so uh, finding out which ones are the best for this given situation is actually up to the given situation, and I would say this is uh, part of a further work to uh, try these uh, implementations out in more complex uh, settings like linear algebra, for instance. Thank you.
We have time for a question. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, I'm Dan Roach from the Naval Academy. I was in the United States. Um, I am in the United States. Anyway, uh, I was wondering about converting the initial conversion into like the golden number representation. So, so your benchmarks seem to be based on you have an exact representation of the inputs, then you're checking the error in the operation. But uh, for example, can you give any bound on the bit length say of uh, if I want, if I have an arbitrary floating point number and I want to convert it into the um, golden representation, how, how much growth might there be in the size of the integers that are uh, required to represent that? Um, I, I don't have uh, any graphs um, with me uh, and, and I, I can't tell you on top of my head, but, but yes, this definitely is a problem. So converting between representations is non-trivial. Um, if you, you know that you want to run your analysis on, on uh, these numbers, then you basically, the, the best you can do is you already prepare your numbers in this representation. So in, in, in let's say, the open domain, this conversion is not that much of a problem. But, but yes, if, if you would try to do this conversion in, in the protected domain already, then this becomes very costly. So, so your, your activity tracker should actually already do the conversion before it starts sending out the protected values. So the idea is that the, the uh, uh, data collector actually does the conver uh, conversion on open values, and then you can do the computations on protected values. More question? So actually, I have a question. So kudos for you know, finally bringing the golden ratio into the realm of MPC. We know that you know, Sorry, the gold. so much echo. I yeah, no. Kudos for bringing the golden ratio into MPC. You know, this number has the meaning of life and everything. So great to, that, to see it here. But I was wondering whether it's uh, necessary to use the golden ratio or whether you have considered using other numbers which satisfy similar quadratic equations and whether they could give you a better error. Yes, yes, yes. We, we, we have considered other numbers as well. And I have actually the PhD student here who, who uh, spent a couple of months uh, trying out different numbers. And in the end of the day, uh, the golden numbers still were, were the best. I'm, I'm not really sure what was the exact reason. We, we actually, at, at some point of time, we, we even had a chapter in the paper saying Wi-Fi. Right. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Do you want to comment on, on this? What's, uh, what was the uh, final reason for, for this? So, so yes, the phi is not the only choice. So, so you, you, you maybe, maybe you want to have a, a higher degree uh, relation for, for the phi. Or it's, it's actually a very, very much open question right now. But yes, for, for our purposes, it, it seemed to work well. Let's thank the speaker again.